Walter. Um, this is a small piece of a current book project for some definitions of current. I'm still working on it. I've been working on it for 15 years. So it's some, in some ways it's an ancient book project. Um, I want to say a uh, warm thanks to Walter and the Humanities Center. Over the time that I've been at Wayne State, uh, I've received a lot of institutional and financial support for the research and writing. The first two chapters I ever wrote of the book were written in a Humanities Center office. Um, and also to thank the History Department, my <coughs> distinguished former chair and distinguished current chair are both here, and I've received a great deal of support from the History Department through the years on this book as well and ongoing. So thanks to, to everyone who's, uh, who's supported this book on the, the English wetlands. Um, so what I want to do is give a little bit of an overview about the fens and where they are and what they are and what makes them fens. Uh, first of all, what are fens? I'm going to talk a little bit about expertise, uh, which is a, a broader interest of mine. Uh, expertise and its role in forming early modern states. Uh, and then I'll talk about how expertise and the Fens collide in the 17th century. Before I get going and forget, uh, I'm happy to see some of my History 1300 students here. Uh, I'm going to send around a sign-in sheet. If you are one of my students, please put your name on it and see that it gets back to me. Uh, so a word on the Fens, or two. Uh, here's your map of England, and some of you have probably seen this map before, but why make slides all over again? Um, the area we're talking about is right there. Um, you'll notice that there is a... Uh, a bay here, it's called the Wash. This is the North Sea, this is East Anglia, this is the Midlands. The Fens are a crescent-shaped area wedged between the Midlands and East Anglia um, that's essentially a very large river delta. During the Ice Age, um, it would have been a lot drier, but before that, it would have been part of the North Sea. Um, it's a very flat territory. It spans about 1,100, well, depending on which number you, you see in terms of who's counting, between 1,100 and 1,300 square miles, that's about 700, 750,000 acres, uh, spanning parts of eight counties. Um, so it's a, it's a relatively large area of, of England. There are, it, it's a drainage sink. Um, there are about six major rivers that flow into the North Sea in this area. Uh, draining some 6,000 square miles of Great Britain. So it's a, it's a very wet area. Uh, it's also very flat. Um, the Fens are the Fens because they are a river delta, or a series of rivers coming together to form one giant delta. Uh, the land is extremely flat. You have these rivers flowing in from the uplands. They're relatively fast-flowing rivers. Uh, they hit the flat part of the Fens where the land levels out, and they slow down. Um, because they're coming with speed from the uplands, they're bringing a lot of silt with them that they've eroded from those uplands. Uh, and when they get into the fens, they slow down, that silt just settles out, and this is part of how the fens have been built. Um, it's the, the river's not flowing nicely to the sea. They slow down, they drop their silt, the fens get bigger. This is a standard river delta story. It's exacerbated by the fact that the fens are also tidal. Uh, this is some of the most tidally interesting area of Europe. Uh, there's about a 25-foot tidal range from low water to high water uh, in that area, which means that the, the Fen rivers actually back up as the tides move in, and that brings in silt from the sea. Uh, it stops the flow of the water. It drops more silt. Uh, and so what you get is a, a, a sort of a concentric ring. Uh, along the coast, you have a series of silt marshes uh, that are largely saltwater flooded. Uh, you get a little further inland, and you have peat fens. The peat is formed when the flooding happens. Uh, the rivers overtop their banks. It spreads very rapidly across the very, very flat landscape. Uh, it kills all the vegetation. The water is alkaline enough to keep it from decaying all the way. It partially decays, and so it winds up forming layers of peat. The peat can be as many as 20 feet thick uh, in parts of the fens, or at least it would have been uh, around before, before the drainage. Uh, we're talking about sort of 20, 20 feet of, of, of peat. Uh, more or less. So you have an extended, very flat region, highly pl prone to flooding, uh, made of silt marsh uh, and alkaline peat. Um, it's defined, it, it is land that is defined by its relationship with the water. Um, there, the seven, in the 17th century, the fens were considered to be marginal land, so around 1550, 1600, the fens were considered marginal land, not good for farming because Wheat and other grains are very picky about the soil they grow in. They don't like especially wet soil, and so this area is com almost completely useless for growing grain in. Um, but that doesn't mean it's, it's worthless. Uh, it's referred to in terms of agricultural history as common waste. 
Um, but all the waste designates is that it's not plowable, not arable land. It is, it is land that is left in common, uh, and it is not without a lot of value. People made, throughout the Middle Ages, made a decent living in the fens, uh, as long as they were willing to work with the land on its own terms and not try to change it into something else. Uh, specifically, they graze livestock. Uh, the common wastes were left in common. Uh, they were not plowed. They were owned by a lord, but they were not plowed and, and planted. Uh, they were left for the grazing of livestock. And so you have an economy in the region that is based on smallhold farmers. Uh, farmers who may have five acres of land, three acres of land, as little as one acre of land. There are even parts of Lincolnshire where there were smallhold farmers with no land to plow. But they were farmers. How do you farm if you have no land? Well, you're living next to one of the largest stretches of common waste uh, in, in Britain. And although it's too wet to grow grain, it is extremely good at growing grass. Uh, the floods do happen every year. It's an annual flooding model, but they tend to happen in the wetter seasons, the winter. Uh, and by April or May at the latest, those floodwaters have generally receded and they'll stay away for the better part of the summer. During that time, uh, the land is actually very fertile for growing grass. Uh, the, the rivers bring in, every year they bring in all the, uh, the, the silt from the, from the uplands, the good soil they've eroded from the, the midlands flows into the fens and gets deposited every year, a little like the Nile Valley. Uh, it refreshes the soil, it grows grass beautifully, and all these smallhold farmers who may have five acres or one acre or even no land at all, virtually every small farmer in the fens had a, a herd of livestock that numbered, we think the average is probably about 20. 10 to 12 milk cows, uh, perhaps as many sheep. So they're producing wool, they have a thriving dairy industry, they're fattening beef cattle. Um, it's a, it's a it's a grazing agriculture, an alternative agriculture based not on planting crops but on grazing livestock, which is why you can have very little land, in fact no land at all, and still be a reasonably prosperous farmer in this region because planting crops is not what you do to make a living. You graze your cows, you take the milk, you make cheese, you make butter, uh, you might fatten them up for beef, and then you can sell those products at any number of, of uh, the market towns uh, that surround the fens in, in that area. Uh, some of the land is better than others. There are rises in it that are a bit above the, the flat. Uh, the largest is known as the Isle of Ely, where the, the cathedral in the region is. I was there last week. It's a rather pretty small town, uh, at least in England these days, then it was a rather major place. Um, if the land is higher, it does get dry, and they, they are able to plant crops on it. They plant barley and oats, which they eat. They plant beans and peas, which they feed to their livestock as fodder. Um, they also plant flax and hemp, which supports a sort of an early proto-clothing uh, industry. They actually do make some clothing there based on the flax and hemp that they grow. And some of the land is worse. It stays flooded almost all the time. You can't do anything with that. You can't even let your livestock graze there. But that's not without value either. That marginal, you know, terribly flooded land uh, still produces things that, the produce that people can use and harvest. Uh, reeds and sedge grow on it. And in a time when every dwelling has a thatched roof, for the most part, uh, that's a valuable building material. There are fish and eels and waterfowl. Uh, the waterfowl especially were easily saleable in any market town. Eels were so abundant, uh, eely mean, means place of eels, uh, that many medieval rents could be paid in eels. Uh, so this is not a trivial commodity. It was a, it was a major industry, the, the fishing industry in the Fens. Uh, and even the peat itself could be harvested. If you dig it out in bricks and set it out to dry in the sun for a couple of months uh, in the drier season, it becomes a burnable product. You can actually burn it, and since there's no timber in the fens, uh, it's handy to have that as a fuel source. Uh, so building materials, foodstuffs, and fuel can be had even from the most flooded land. Uh, and that is how uh, agriculture in the fens uh, tended to work. So it does support a population. Compared to the rest of Britain, the Fens are relatively sparsely populated, uh, but we know that throughout the Middle Ages, they built many fine stone churches, which is a sign of local prosperity. There's no question that people were doing living fairly comfortably in these small Fenland towns. Uh, they couldn't live in the middle of the flooded land, but they lived in the peripheries around it and on some of the raised aisles, and they would have been aisles, by the way, in the winter when the floods came. Um, they also are, um, we know from medieval tax rolls that they were at worst around average in terms of the taxes they were assessed in throughout the Middle Ages. And in some cases, the, the driest parts of the fens actually were above average. 
uh, in the taxes that they paid. Uh, based upon this thriving livestock industry, they made, they made a good living. Um, it also has, though it's a relatively sparse population, it is probably the fastest growing uh, other than London, uh, probably the fastest growing part of the population of the British Isles, uh, in part because these vast common wastes, uh, at a time of general population growth, when there's less room, less opportunity on the land for, for people generally, migrating to the fens is not a bad move. It's a place you're likely to catch malaria, uh, but it's also a place where if you can somehow manage to get two or three head of, head of cattle, uh, you don't need any farmland. You don't need to rent a cottage. You can, there's a lot of squatting going on in the fence where people sort of throw up a cottage, uh, get a few livestock, send them out in a common waste. Uh, it's a place where there's economic opportunity for people who don't have a lot of available economic opportunity. Um, so uh, we know it's a, a, a rapidly growing population. By the time you get to the year 1600 or so, uh, the Fens are beginning to reach their population limit already. There's concern that there's not enough common grazing land for the growing population and all the cattle that are, that are living on it. So this is a, a relatively prosperous region um, throughout the Middle Ages. And I, I guess I'll, I'll pause. This is a, a few images of it. Uh, the top two images here, and I've just gotten done in Ely. What I was doing there was taking my own pictures for the book so that I don't have to worry about buying them from anybody else, but I didn't get a, I didn't get a chance to put them in the slideshow, so these are still images I've borrowed from elsewhere on the internet. Um, these are images of what the fens may have looked like before they were drained. Um, they are taken at what are now wetlands nature conservancies, which I'm going to come back to at the end, uh, which have tried to either preserve or to re-flood parts of the fens to make them look the way they look, would have looked uh, during the, their 16th century and back beyond. The bottom two pictures are what most of the fens look like now. And as you can see, it's a very flat landscape. Um, the, that's a drainage ditch. There's a drainage ditch that's recently had all the sedge taken out of it. Uh, you can get a sense of it's a very artificial water system. These rivers run straight for miles, 10, 15, 20, 25 miles across the countryside to the vanishing point on the horizon. Uh, and on each side of them, you'll see beautiful soil that by and large looks like that. Soil that is really grade A farmland, among the finest farmland that anywhere in northern Europe has to offer, in part because of that peat uh, that built up over, over yards of it uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the, the Ice Age and, and back, uh, back beyond. Um, so some, some images of what the fens uh, look like before and look like now. I'll let you see the beautiful pictures while I pause to say a few words about expertise, which is my really my larger image, um, or larger interest. Throughout my career, I've been interested in the nature of expertise uh, in the early modern periods, sort of 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. How expertise was made, learned, communicated, identified, legitimized, and contested, and it certainly is contested. Um, and especially the role that experts played in helping to build and form the early modern nation state. Um, early modern states had need of significant technical expertise. The 16th and 17th centuries, almost anywhere you go, and certainly Western Europe, uh, is a time of what we now recognize as state formation. Uh, relatively small and weak medieval governments begin to try to transform themselves into something much larger, much more unitary, uh, much more capable of, of ruling uh, in, in practice as well as in name, large areas, areas the size of France or England or Spain, uh, in a way that medieval regimes rarely actually tried to do. Uh, they needed technical knowledge in order to accomplish the things that early modern states wanted to accomplish. Uh, and I've written about a, a various different cases in, in, in other forums. Uh, building harbors, digging mines, smelting metals, building fortresses, forging cannon, building sailing vessels, sailing the globe with some hope that you might be able to find your way where you're going and find your way home from there again, which is no mean feat uh, when you're crossing the ocean. All of these are technical ventures. They, they require a mastery of technology and skill and what I've called expertise. Uh, experts make the state more powerful by putting their knowledge and their skill and their experience at the disposal of the states and the patrons that they serve, giving them powers to control and shape their natural world uh, in a way that they had never been able to do before, at least not since the Romans had done it before them. 
Um, this gives the state greater legitimacy. Uh, it's power to be able to shape the natural world, to exploit your resources more fully, to organize your populations, to collect information about the, the, the stuff in your country. What's there? What's valuable? How is it used? How can it be used better? How can we tax it? Um, how can we protect it from various threats? Uh, the ability to collect that information, act upon that information, makes states powerful. It also makes them legitimate. Part of what makes a state um, what justifies their rule is their ability to accomplish such things. But really where I began is I, I started thinking about Queen Elizabeth and her advisors in England, Lord Burley, the Earl of Leicester, um, who do not know how to do any of these things, but need, to, but need to govern a state where they need to do these things. What? We had a lecture two weeks ago from Professor Sledge on John D. John D., yes. Uh, he's, he's one of these people. Um, he's a rather odd one. <laughs> uh, he's actually written on Fen Drain and Sean D. did, um, but I'll leave him alone uh, for, for, the, for the present because he didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, in order for states to become legitimate, they have to be able to exercise these kinds of powers. To exercise these powers, they need people who do know how to do these things, which means they need to find them, identify them, uh, marshal them into service, control them, uh, and be able to determine whether the people who claim they know how to do something actually do know how to do it. It's, it's a negotiating process. Uh, experts themselves serve the state, and they also derive their legitimacy from that service. So the state becomes legitimate when it can control that expertise. The experts themselves also bolster the legitimacy by serving a powerful patron, such as the King of England uh, or the King of Spain. Uh, that helps to bolster their own claims to expertise, and so it is a, a bit of a bootstrapping process. They are, they are helping to build one another. Now, I want to say it's a, something I've called expertise. Expertise is not a native 16th century or 17th century word or concept. Uh, no one ever said expertise in any European language uh, until the 19th century. They did occasionally say the word expert, but when they did, they most often meant in the sense of experienced. Uh, the Latin would be expertus sum, I have experience. That's what that means. Uh, so to say that someone is expert at something in the 16th century means usually they have done it many times, many times before, uh, and they're sure they can do it again. It's, it's, a, it's a designation of experience uh, before it is anything else. So in importing the word back to the early modern period, I am employing um, anachronism. Uh, many of my colleagues have questioned that uh, and, and beat me about the head for it on occasion. I defend it nevertheless. Uh, and the reason I, I insist that expertise is a useful historical concept in the early modern period is that something is going on. There actually is a new kind of knowledge that they may not be calling expertise, but they are aware that it is not just craft knowledge, it is not just artisanal knowledge, and it is not just rooted in experience. Uh, there is a new kind of knowledge that people are laying claim to, and I argue that by the time you get to the 19th century, we have started calling it expertise. But the negotiation over what that knowledge is has its roots at least as far back as the 16th century. Uh, and depending on where you are in Europe, it may go back further. Um, I've argued elsewhere that early modern expertise generally consisted of the following qualities. First, to be expert was to control a body of specialized, practical, productive knowledge not readily available to everyone. It has to be useful, it has to be practical, and it has to be something that not everyone knows how to do. Plowing your field probably would not have been considered expertise in the 16th century because too many people knew how to do that. Uh, but a blacksmith, uh, is, it, that's the kind of knowledge that not everyone has. So practical, productive knowledge not readily available to everyone. Second, it was based at least in part on extensive experience, though not always exclusively so. Uh, and again, some of my favorite examples are... By the time I get to the year 1600, I've written about navigators, people who are calling themselves navigators, who have actually never been to sea. And the claim they're making is they understand spherical trigonometry and complex mathematics, and they know how to use the tools that a navigator should use. They are therefore capable of teaching this art, but they have never actually been to sea and employed it there. Yet they're writing books, they're gaining patronage, they're not calling themselves experts, but there's, again, some new kind of knowledge being born there that is not rooted entirely in experience. Usually it is, but not always so. 
Third, it involves the abstraction or the distillation of theory from practice. It is not just knowing how to do something, but understanding why something works the way it does, which is why I can have mathematicians claiming that they are navigators, even though they've never been to sea. They claim they understand the theory, and that is why they are able to lay claim to that knowledge. Uh, it is not based on experience. Fourth, Experts are distinguishable from common practitioners or artisans who usually tend to work in a specific local context. Expertise is almost by definition not local. Uh, local knowledge is, is what a craftsman has, what an artisan has. Experts are laying claim to something larger than that, more theoretical, broader, more abstract, more generalizable. Uh, a, a stonemason is not an architect, and although we which one you might call an expert might vary according to your, your needs and your circumstances. Um, even by the, the 16th century, there's an understanding that an expert, that, that, a, that an architect and a stonemason, though they're each involved in building a fortress, have different jobs. One of them knows everything there is to know about how to put stones together so they stay there where, they, where they're put. But the other one designs the fortress and tells the stonemason what to do. Uh, and that's more where, where I would argue this expertise tends to live, is in that theoretical abstraction of the knowledge. Um, the claim to something more universal and more general than, than something specific and tangible and local. Um, another great example of this uh, is, is a riverboat pilot. Uh, if you've ever read Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain, you have a very good sense of what local knowledge is about. The ability to take your boat anywhere you want in the Mississippi River practically with your eyes closed because you personally know where every sandbar is. And yet that's while that's certainly knowledge and useful knowledge, it's not generalizable. You could take the same riverboat pilot and put him in the Amazon or the Nile and he'd kill himself. Uh, it's not abstract, it's not theoretical, it's very, very local knowledge and therefore not expertise in the sense that I'm using it. And finally, expertise does not exist outside of a socio-political context. And what I mean by that is uh, you're not an expert until you've convinced somebody else that you are an expert. Uh, it requires some sort of public acknowledgement, affirmation, and legitimation in order to make it real. And that's vital in, this, in the early modern period because you can't just say, look, I graduated from MIT and here is my you know, mechanical engineering master's degree. Uh, that's how you justify yourself as an expert in that field today. But before there is MIT, before there is a master's degree in mechanical engineering, uh, you're just a guy who says he knows how to do something, and you're not an expert if you can't get somebody else to believe in you and take a chance on that. Not everyone who studies expertise would agree with that, but that's, uh, that's where I come down in that argument. Somebody has to believe you uh, if it's going to matter and be real. Um, these criteria were all being debated in countless fields of practice in early modern Europe. Land drainage is just <coughs> one of them. But the Fens are an important case study in understanding these debates. Um, experience versus theoretical understanding, local versus universal knowledge, uh, conservation versus adaptation and transformation, uh, all of these are, under, in, are in play in the Fens uh, because cultural attitudes toward the Fens shifted radically during the early modern period, necessitating new approaches to draining the land and thus new forms of expertise in getting it drained. Uh, so that's where expert, my expertise interests come from. How does this all play into the Fens? I would argue there's a, a, a radical shift in kinds of Fenland expert. Who, who could constitute expert knowledge in the Fens, uh, or at least mastery of knowledge in the Fens? Um, throughout the Middle Ages, the Fens were perceived as a challenging and at times dangerous landscape, but one, one that could nevertheless be successfully managed to allow the land to be productive. The Fens were challenging to be sure, but you could make a good living there. Medieval Fenlanders understood the key to their local prosperity lay not in preventing the floods, but in managing those floods uh, successfully. The flood waters are what bring new life to the soil. They're the reason it grows abundant grass. They're the fount of all the wetland produce, the eels, the fish, the waterfowl, the reeds, the sedge. Uh, all of that happens because the land floods. So you aren't trying to stop the floods. You're trying to manage them. Make sure they're as predictable and regular as possible, that they disappear when they're supposed to disappear so that you can then take advantage of the land the way that you would like to. Managing Fenland drainage is therefore, for the Middle Ages, a conservative enterprise. And for centuries, it's overseen by local bodies called commissions of sewers. A sewer being the early modern English word for any drain. Uh, these commissions of sewers are bodies that begin evolving out of local customs as early as the 11th century. They're an extremely old institution in, in England. Uh, by the 14th century, they are in increasingly institutionalized. Uh, they are issued by the crown 
Commissioners of sewers are appointed by the Crown through the Court of Chancery, uh, and they are, um, their powers are regulated by parliamentary statutes. So they begin as very much local custom, but by the 14th century, they're governed by Parliament, they're appointed by the Crown, they are a, a tool of royal governance uh, in England. Who are these people? The commissioners of sewers are mostly local gentry and more prosperous yeomen, so local farmers who own land. They're local elites. They're assumed to have the greatest understanding of the local conditions, the way things ought to work, the way things have always worked, what you need to do to keep them working that way, and perhaps above all, who ought to be responsible, because most of what they do is find problems and say, that guy's responsible for fixing that drain or keeping that wall in good shape. He didn't do it. If you don't do it by next month, we'll find you. Um, that is largely what the day-to-day -day business of these commissions and sewers look like. It's a conservative enterprise built on local knowledge of local elites because they understand the way things have always worked here and are responsible for keeping them working that way. They're fascinating from a political standpoint because their word is law. They have judicial power in the sense that they are a court of record. They can impanel juries. They can call witnesses. They can swear witnesses and take testimony. They can render verdicts. They have executive powers. They have the power to hire workmen, to buy supplies, to levy taxes, uh, to fine people who don't pay their taxes. They can even have the power to confiscate goods and put people in prison for disobeying their decrees. So they have robust executive powers. They also have legislative powers. They can pass new laws. And if they send those laws back to the Court of Chancery and enroll them, literally write them on a piece of parchment that gets rolled up with all the other laws, uh, hence enrolled, um, those laws become permanently binding. They can only be overturned by an, an act of parliament. So legislative, executive, and judicial power, that's sweeping. On the other hand, they're fundamentally limited in their jurisdiction. Rarely do they cover anything as large as a county. They most often cover a village, a manor, a particular fen. Within that area, they are the, rule, they are the law of the land. Outside of that, they are powerless. Um, they also tend to be called into being for specific purposes. There has been a flood. There has been a breach of the riverbank. Uh, there has been a breach of the seawall. Therefore, we issue a commission of sewers to fix a problem. Uh, we give it to these local guys and say, fix the problem as seems best to you. They fix the problem by trying to put things back the way they were, and then they disappear. They tend to be very ad hoc bodies designed to serve a specific function uh, and then go away. Um, so they're fundamentally local in their composition and conservative in their approach. They are not trying to change the land. They are not intended to change the land. They are intended to keep the land as it is as best they can. They solve limited problems with conservative solutions, uh, and they're made up of local landowners who can best be trusted to know how to do that. This changes in the 16th century. It changes in the 16th century because the fens change in the 16th century for a variety of reasons, the flooding around 1550 gets markedly worse, uh, there, or at least we think it does. There's a lot of theories about why the flooding got worse. The most likely candidate we now realize in an era that's fascinated by climate change is climate change. The so-called Little Ice Age hit Europe uh, during the 14th and 15th and into the 16th centuries. Uh, England's weather got noticeably colder and wetter starting around 1560, 1570. At that point, Fenland flooding became more unpredictable, more severe, more dangerous. The land came to be perceived as broken. Uh, so there's a perception starting in the late 16th century that the Fens are somehow dysfunctional. Uh, the metaphors that crop up to describe this are various. Uh, they're broken, they're in need of repair, they're diseased and in need of a cure, they loved medical metaphors, uh, or most dramatically, they are lost and in need of salvation, something that will redeem and save the Fens from their, their fallen selves. Um, moreover, the land alone is not viewed as dysfunctional, but so are its inhabitants. They come to be seen by the end of the 16th century as lazy, sickly, and malaria is still endemic in England in this period, ungovernable, um, even a threat to public order. Uh, the Fens do pose something of a threat to the public peace and order because, of course, if you're a rebel or a bandit, uh, one of the greatest places to hole up is in a swamp. Uh, it's very, very difficult for the king to march his army into the swamp. It's easy for people to hide there. Uh, so the Fens begin to be perceived as a real drain upon the, the resources of the Commonwealth uh, of, uh, and, a, and a danger to the security of the state. Um, 
this doesn't happen all at once, but it does happen between 1570 and 1600. You see a shift from the fens as problematic but manageable and productive landscape to drain on the commonwealth and threat to the security of the state. Uh, and as I say, that's largely because the flooding became more unpredictable, more severe, uh, and more of a problem. Uh, the people who live there are problematic as well, as I say, sick, lazy, sickly, ungovernable, potentially rebellious. They are not proper English farmers. Uh, they are a threat to the, to the public order. Yes? Um, when did that attitude change towards the people come? Was it like always there or...? To some extent, it's always there. The, the fens are filled with, with people who graze livestock. They're not nomadic. Uh, but if one of the things I've discovered in this, the course of this project is if you look at European attitudes, really, farmers' attitudes toward people who graze and herd for a living, especially if they have to be nomadic, they are always savages. They are always uncivilized. They are always a threat to the state. Um, the Fenlanders are, to some extent, looked down upon by the rest of England. But again, for most of the Middle Ages, they're prosperous, they're paying their taxes, their taxes are notable. Um, they're not a place most people would prefer to live. It's very difficult to keep um, clergy and school teachers in the Fens. Uh, resident, there are very few resident gentry in the Fens. So people who can live elsewhere do. But it's not until you get to the 16th century that you see a repeated rhetoric, um, it, well into the 17th century, that the Fens are a place that are, that's broken. The people who live there are a threat and a problem, and we need to fix all of it. Um, before you can fix the Fens, you need to imagine the Fens as a single region with a single problem, and that really starts around 1580. Yep. Is there an ethnic component to that, too? No. As far as I know, there's no ethnic component to it. Um, they're, in, they're, they're rumored to have webbed feet <laughs> and webbed hands, um, but they're, they, they're, they speak English. They're, they're, not noticeably different in terms of religion or language or anything else from people who live in the... And they have plenty of interaction with the people in the uplands uh, throughout the Middle Ages as well. It's hard to march an army through the fens. It's not hard to transport. You just use the rivers. Um, if you're taken on a boat, you can go anywhere you want. You just can't do that with your army uh, as easily. Um, so the fens become a problem, defined as a problem. The Fenlanders themselves, you ask them, continue to view the fens as a local problem. If you asked a Fenlander what's wrong with the fens in 1580, 1590, it's the commissions of sewers not doing their jobs. They're not being diligent enough. Uh, they're not pursuing the laws the way they should. They've they become lazy themselves, or they're pursuing private interests. They've decided that somehow in their, in their interest not to, not to repair the drain on their land, for example, but to make that something more of a public uh, expense. It's the commissions of sewers failing to do their job. That's what a Fenlander would have told you. It still remains a local problem and still one of conservative management that somebody's just dropped the ball on. That's not the view that the Crown has, however. Um, outsiders come to see the Fens themselves as the problem. The region has a, it, first of all, they conceive it as a region. It's no longer this Fen is flooded, this village is problematic. This is when you start seeing commissions of sewers being issued not for a village or a manor, but for a county, or increasingly for the region, for six counties together. Uh, such a commission would have made no sense in the Middle Ages. They were supposed to solve local problems. After 1580, you get regular commissions for what they call the Great Level, which is 350,000 acres spanning six counties. Uh, that's a very radically different kind of commission. And it's indicative of the crown beginning to think of the Fens as a region with a single problem that is going to require more aggressive management and intervention to fix it. Um, they become convinced that outside solutions are required uh, to deal with the problem. And that brings me to my second group of experts, the projectors or undertakers. Sometimes they're adventurers. Uh, different terms used. Uh, they're projectors in the sense that they are undertakers of a project. People who would agree to undertake a project on behalf of the crown and themselves. They do it at their own expense. They use their own plans and their own knowledge, their own expertise. Uh, and in return, they receive a suitable reward. Uh, the 17th and 18th centuries in particular are the great ages of projecting in England. Um, these are the, what we would now call the job creators. Uh, they are entrepreneurial, risk-taking individuals who propose to undertake a project on behalf of the crown in return for a suitable reward should they succeed. They're a common figure in England in the 17th century, uh, particularly in England, and they propose all sorts of grand schemes, uh, promising unimaginable profits from them, all at a time when the crown's finances are strapped and the crown is basically broke. Um, 
King James I, King Charles I, they are all looking for every conceivable source of revenue, and there's no shortage of people who come in and say, look, I know a better way to manufacture gunpowder. I know a better way to plow land. I know a better way to build ships. I know a better way to, to, to all kinds, to, to mine and smelt alchemists. There's all sorts of different projectors who are pitching these pie-in-the-sky schemes to the crown at a time when the crown is very willing to listen to them because it needs to maximize every revenue stream it has. Now, they have an unsavory reputation in many circles. Projectors are widely ridiculed as either fools uh, at best or charlatans and frauds at worst. Um, ben Johnson has a projector, projectors in many of his plays showing what, what frauds and ridiculous characters they are. Uh, so not everyone takes these guys seriously, but enough people do, and enough powerful people do, that they become semi-legitimate within the state. Drainage projectors are very much of this milieu. Many of them promised Queen Elizabeth, King James I, King Charles I, that they would drain the entire fens and keep them dry forever. They do so at their own expense, and in return all they asked was a share of the newly drained land. The average was around a third of the newly drained land. So I'll drain 300,000 acres for you, keep it dry forever, do it at my own expense, in return, I become the, the owner of 100,000 now valuable drained acres of land. Um, Fenlanders view these men as dangerous frauds. What they promise, first of all, is viewed as impossible to accomplish, and trying to accomplish this is inevitably going to cause damage. They're only going to make a mess if they come in here and try this. But even assuming they were able to do what they claim they're doing and get rid of all the floodwaters, the Fenlanders can't think of a worse idea. They understand perfectly well the land is productive, from their point of view, because it floods. Because every year the floodwaters come down, dropping the new riverine silt. Uh, every year the grass grows because the land has plenty of silt and plenty of water and plenty of nutrients. We know that in dry years it doesn't grow as much grass. So it's impossible to drain it. This is the way God made the land. It is organically made thus. Uh, changing it's impossible, but even if you could change it, what a terrible idea because then it would lose everything that makes it valuable to us. So Fenlanders, by and large, have very little patience for this, but that's not the view shared by the Crown. The Crown sees this as an opportunity to fix a very large problem at no cost to the Royal Treasury. Again, these projectors always agree to undertake these things at their own expense and that of the investors they line up. Um, the, and it's going to be a benefit for everyone. The land will be improved, its productivity and value will increase sharply, and the inhabitants of the region will not only become more prosperous, they'll also become healthier, they'll become more governable, they'll become more civilized in the process. Yes? Yes, sir, with the term uh, zoning, uh, did that have been applied by the crowd or the uh, Fenlanders? I'm sorry, what term? Uh, zoning? Z zoning. They, they certainly don't... They don't use that term. In terms of management for the, you know, the wetlands and so on. They don't. They, as far as I know, they don't, they don't employ any sort of a, a zoning concept. Um, they do think about what land is likely to be more productive. But again, the projectors tell them the land will all be excellent. Um, once we get the water off, this is some of the best soil in all of Europe. Uh, it's, it's got that rich peat. You, you see the color of it there. Um, it's, it's wonderful farmland if we could just keep the, the, the water off. So they're, it, they don't, they don't, they don't use any, any sort of concept of zoning that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, they, they talk about you know, broken land that they will, they will fix, but they, they're not interested in leaving any of it as fens. The, the more they can uh, drain, the, the, the better. That may have come into existence as public works did perhaps. Yeah, much, much later. Yeah. But with this, this would be 1630s where mm -hmm. we're having this conversation uh, to, to, get it, to, to really get it going. Um, in a word, draining the fens from the Crown's point of view, is going to incorporate the region more fully into the English monarchical state, uh, and it's going to integrate it more fully into England's growing market, global market economy. It makes the Fens more like the rest of England to everyone's eventual benefit. It literally enlarges the realm. It promotes the common wealth. Uh, there's one quote from, an, from a, uh, a, a proponent of these projects saying that uh, what a wonderful thing it is to improve a realm, it's far better to improve a realm than it is to conquer a new one. Um, this is very much seen, should be seen, I would argue, as internal colonization. Uh, they are talking about the Fens in the 17th century in exactly the same terms they're talking about Virginia, Barbados, and Ireland. 
these are broken, savage lands that need to be civilized by good, God-fearing Protestant English farmers who can fix the land, who can fix the people who live on the land, turn them into something that looks like good, prosperous English farmers on good, prosperous English farmland. Uh, but in the same terms they're talking about Ireland, Virginia, Barbados, they're also talking about the Fens. Uh, it is not only seen as equivalent to a colonial venture, it is very often the same people talking about it. Uh, I have documented cases where investors in Fen drainage projects were also investing in Ireland, were also investing in the East India Company, were also investing in the Virginia Plantation. Um, these are people who are thinking about transforming the world into good English farmland, and it starts at home. Uh, in the fence. So it is very much a state building enterprise and a colonial enterprise. Um, in some ways it's a dress rehearsal for Ireland. There's actually an expression uh, in terms of misfortune in England from the farm to the fen, from the fen to Ireland. They'd like to turn it around from Ireland to the fen and from the fen to the farm. Um, so internal colonization is I think a, an appropriate model for looking at this. Uh, what's called for then is no mere management of the Fenland floods but their eradication. You're not conservatively managing the Fens anymore. You are transforming them by eradicating what defines them and has defined them for centuries and millennia. You're also, of course, in the process, completely transforming the local economy, the local social structure. Uh, you're going to create something new here, fundamentally different, uh, recovering an entire region that has for, for far too long been abandoned as waste. Given this new approach, the real problem with the Fens is rooted in the very commissions of sewers that have been tasked with maintaining the region to begin with. No longer is their local knowledge and conservative approach viewed as a virtue. Now they are viewed as far too local and provincial, far too conservative in their approach. The commissioners are hidebound now. They're unable to conceive of what the Fens might become with a, a more visionary approach. Uh, they can't conceive of what the region, how the region would benefit from being transformed. They can't come up with any credible way to do it. That's not what they're designed to do. Uh, so the commissions go from being the people who manage the fens and keep them working to the people who are standing in the way of transforming them into something much better. They need to be superseded and replaced, and that's where the projectors come in. The projectors are not by and large Fenlanders. In fact, most of them aren't English. They come from the Low Countries where they have great experience of draining the lands. Uh, they claim a universal theoretical understanding of land drainage. Uh, they can drain your wetlands no matter where you are in Europe. Central France, uh, Germany, uh, Ireland, England, and they're, by the way, going all over these parts of Europe from the Low Countries and draining these areas. Uh, so they are laying claim to a more universal theoretical kind of knowledge, and they, they'd be perfectly happy to come in and clean up your fence for you in return for a suitable reward, usually a third of the land, which of course they don't keep, they wind up selling. Uh, the profits come more from land speculation uh, than anything else. The projectors seem to be the perfect solution to the problem from the Crown's point of view because they're offering truly innovative solutions. The answer to the question, the solution to the problem that is now the fence, if the land is a problem, the projectors are the solution to that problem. They're offering to do it without costing the Crown a nickel or a penny uh, at a time when the Crown doesn't have a nickel or a penny to rub together. Uh, and they're going to make the state more powerful, more governable, more unified, uh, they're going to improve the commonwealth by, uh, by doing this. Um, with the firm backing of the crown, therefore, the projectors are all ultimately able to supersede the commission of the sewers as the dominant drainage experts in the fens. They gain the legitimacy not primarily from the results of their endeavors, which are mixed at best, the land is nice farmland now. Uh, it wasn't so necessarily even by the end of the 17th century. This is an ongoing process. Uh, the fens are only dry now because there are very, very large electric pumps that keep them dry at all times. Uh, those pumps are a formidable ally in this, uh, but left to itself, this land would flood again. Um, but they gain their legitimacy from the patronage of the crown and the other prominent investors who back them. Um, I was going to say something about a, a, an 18th century iteration of this. Uh, I won't say much about them now in the interest of, of time. Uh, but of course, the projectors don't fully succeed in draining the land. They do pretty well, but it has a lot of problems. And over, over the decades between 1650 and 1700, a lot of their projects actually fall apart. So by the 1720s, you have another wave of experts. Uh, now you have professional engineers and surveyors. 
uh, who come in and say, well, these projectors had some interesting ideas. They were certainly visionary entrepreneurs, but they knew nothing about engineering. They knew nothing about mathematics. They weren't calculating uh, you know, the, the, flow, the rate of flow of the rivers. They weren't calculating the, the, the elevation of the land. What they need is a rational approach, an engineering approach, a mathematical, technological approach. What they need is Isaac Newton. They need Isaac Newton's theory of the tides. If only they'd had Newton, they, they would have really known how to drain this land. So there's a, a third wave of experts, I would argue, in the 18th century that looks at what the projectors did and said, well, entrepreneurial and visionary, yes, but not so much on the rational engineering part. So the engineers uh, become a more rational version of expert in the 18th century. And I would argue that that held sway all the way down to the 21st century but in the 21st century, we're beginning to see a fourth wave of expertise coming into the fens, and that is wetland conservators, wetland conservancies. Um, there is now a move in the English fens to re-reclaim them, to re-flood this land. Um, and you have a number of wetlands conservancies that have grown up over the last 20 to 30 years uh, and are really going gangbusters now. They are purchasing farms that go bankrupt or farmers who just wish to sell their land. They are reflooding the land. Uh, Wiccan Fen uh, in Cambridgeshire. Wiccan sort of a strange case because they were never. That, it's a very small place that was actually too wet to drain, so it never actually got drained. But now it's under the purview of the Wiccan Fen Nature Reserve. It's an important wildlife sanctuary. Um, the uh, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds (RSPB). It uh, has about five wetlands conservancies. Lake and Heath Fen is where some of the photos that I showed you before were taken. Um, these are internationally important wildlife refuges, particularly for migratory birds. Uh, within five years of reflooding Lake and Heath, 750 acres of previously farmland, planting grain and onions and peas and whatever else, reflooded. Within five years, they had hundreds of different species of birds spotted. They now have poplar trees growing everywhere. They've got sedge, reeds. Um, they've got all kinds of birds, all kinds of fish. I don't know whether they have eels coming back yet or not. Uh, but these are internationally important wildlife sanctuaries. I would argue that the wetlands conservancies constitute a fourth wave of expertise and a very interesting one because they're hybrid. Uh, they are both transformative and conservative. They want to transform the land, but transform it back into what it should have been in the first place. They also see the land as broken. But it's broken because those idiots in the 17th century broke it, and we would like to fix it as best we can. They neither claim local knowledge specifically nor abstract knowledge uh, about land drainage. They're coming at this from more of a scientific point of view. They are biologists. They are ecologists. They're ornithologists. They're botanists. Uh, that is the basis of their expertise, and that is why they understand the true value of wetlands uh, in a way that we didn't understand that 40 years ago, and that is why the fens need to be reclaimed once more as wetlands. They need to be fixed from the time they were broken by the people who broke them in the 17th century. Uh, so it's, it's a resurgence of the understanding of wetlands as intrinsically valuable, not because you can grave livestock on them, uh, but because they are important for the sake of the environment. Though I would add they do graze livestock on them, because one of the first things they realized is if you don't have livestock grazing in this area, um, the plants that you would expect to see in the fens don't actually grow. Um, they. I, I argue in the book that in, in that sense there actually is not and never has been anything as such a thing as a natural fenland. Um, the fens as far back as the Ice Age, as far back as we can trace, have had human inhabitants who have shaped the land in part by grazing livestock on it. And so what we think of as natural fens only exist if you actually farm them. Uh, you need, so the, the Wiccan fen maintains a, a herd of horses and a herd of cattle and they have to graze the land in order to keep it looking the way fens ought to look. So it is natural, but still very carefully managed. Um, so I guess I'd leave it there in terms of the, the, the intersection of expertise in the fens, and that should leave us some time for questions. Yes? A very quick question and a different question. Is there any relationship between the readmittance to the, of the Jews into England in 1651? Is it possible the speculators were Jewish or the investors, and that had anything to do with the reallowance of Jews to enter? England. No, uh, it happens at the same time, um, and and it's, but it's coincidental. Uh, the the Civil War period, 1640s and 50s, is a time in England of massive experimentation, massive interest in agricultural improvement. 
you cut off the king's head, there's no rules anymore. We're making this up as we go. Um, they readmit the Jews to England, but they uh, that's not related to what they're interested in doing in land range. And the investors are, uh, early on, are almost entirely Dutch, uh, who, who've invested in many a drainage project back home. This is simply another investment for them. Uh, once the English investors and landowners see that succeed, uh, it, it's not hard to line up English investors either, but, it's, but they're, they're, not, they're, they're English or Dutch, not Jews, Jewish. Uh, quite a directly related guy. This is a topic I studied with the formation of the Royal Society for Science and mm -hmm. Freemasonry, where the expertise then would have been more based on a Freemasonic rank that uh, a person's expertise, and is there some connection between the draining of the fens in the formation of the Royal Society? There's no specific connection between the drainage of the Fens and the formation of the Royal Society, none, none that I'm aware of with, with, uh, with the Masons. Um, what I would say is that um, the Royal Society is 1662. Uh, before that, you have the interest in you know, that sort of college, uh, the Invisible College at Oxford and, and whatnot. Um, it's, again, contemporaneous, and some of its interests in improvement and, and improving the Commonwealth are, are shared. Um, but you don't see most figures in the Royal Society, in fact, I'm not aware of anyone in the Royal Society who's also interested in fen drainage. Um, you, you get that much more by the time you get to 1700, when, it, when you start to see that professional engineer and surveyor uh, taking over from the, from the entrepreneurial projector. That's when you start to see more of a scientific and technical uh, Royal Society type of interest. But both groups are interested in, in improving the Commonwealth. That's, that's a, a cultural universal in England during the, the interregnum period. Stanley. Um, after the first waves of, of uh, improvement have uh, run their course, let's say by roughly the end of the 18th century, what has the monarchy gotten out of this? The end of the 18th century, you say? Um, all right, so the crown is, and always is, one of, if not the largest landowner in the fence. Um, so the crown has a sizable stake in improving this land. Um, what they're interested in primarily is uh, increasing the rent income, the revenue stream from the rent uh, of that land, so they can lease it out. Um, not, common waste isn't leased out at all, and such land as is leased it gets a very low rent because it's not high quality, you can't grow grain on it. Um, what they're looking for primarily is the ability to rent out that land at a higher rate um, because it's now improved and you'd be able to, to plant more valuable crops on it. What have they reaped from it? Not much. Um, the drainage in the largest part of the Fens, the Great Level, is successful through the 1650s and into the 1660s. Um, there are unintended consequences to it. Uh, in particular, peat, when you drain it, shrinks. Um, you drain the water out of it, it shrinks right away. Also, when you take the water out, the alkalinity that's protecting the vegetable matter from decay can't do that anymore. The bacteria eat the soil, it becomes dust and blows away. Um, so there's actually been a great shrinkage of the land. It had been about 12 to 20 feet above sea level. Now most of the fence is at sea level or even a little below. It's really subsided, which means that the rivers they built that worked in the 1650s by the 1680s are beginning to back up and even flow backwards. Um, so by 1700, we know that most of this land had reflooded, uh, and that's why there's another interest in the 1720s of draining it again. Um, by the time you get to the 19th century, professional engineers have actually made real inroads on keeping the land dry. And at that point, the land is valuable. The crown parts of it alongside everybody else's, and it becomes more, more valuable, leasable land. Uh, by the way, the smallhold farmers who used to predominate in the flooded fens disappear um, because they can no longer, they don't no longer have access to the common waste to graze their livestock on, which means they can't live on an acre of land anymore. Uh, they lose their position in the land. They become wage laborers uh, on the larger, now consolidated, enclosed estates of those who were able to invest in the drainage. That's a wider story in early modern England, but it's really exacerbated in the fens by the drainage that that middling smallhold farmer disappears in favor of large farmers and wage laborers. So there's an income gap that what, that opens in the fence. So from the strictly royal point of view, this has been fruitless. No, not by the 19th century. But by 1700, yes, this is this has been a boondoggle. 
by 1800, they've actually managed to keep the land dry. I want to stress, too, they're really good at keeping the land dry. I was on my barnstorming, you know, loose ends, tying up research trip over the last two weeks in England. I had to go to Oxfordshire, I had to go to Ely, uh, I had to go to Nottingham. So I got to see a good chunk of the Midlands. Oxfordshire is some of the finest land in all of Europe. This is the heart of the English Midlands, and it was mostly standing water in the fields. It's been very wet this winter. Oxfordshire is flooded. I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm not going to get any pictures of the fens. I'll probably have to swim to my hotel if Oxfordshire is flooded. Not a bit of it. The fens are fine. They're planting their crops. They're planting their crops because the entire region has been designed to be well drained, and it has electric pumps at key points functioning all the time to make sure the land stays drained. So while Oxfordshire is now flooded, uh, Lincolnshire and Cambridgeshire, where the heart of the fens are, are just fine. And that's because the drainage is actually very successful. Though, it's disconcerting to stand on an elevated riverbank. And I'm, these riverbanks were built up 20 feet high. So that you know, razor straight river cutting through the countryside, you're standing on a 12 to 20 foot riverbank, looking down two or three feet on a raging river, and about 15 feet down, to the surrounding farmland. It is surreal to see water higher than the surrounding farmland. That is not how nature is supposed to work. It exists that way because of the pumps that work constantly to keep it that way, um, which is why when those banks get breached, the water just spills out into the land that's below it and as flat as a pancake anyway. Um, when the fens do flood, they flood badly, uh, but they're good at controlling it now. Um, water always wins, though. Yeah? So the Nature Conservancy still have been Successful? They have been successful. Uh, Lake and Heath is marvelous, uh, as is Wiccan. Uh, they're, they're beautiful nature trails. They're trying to build hundreds and hundreds of acres uh, around Wiccan. They had, a, they had a nucleus that had never been drained, but they're now adding to it uh, as many acres as they can. They would like to make them contiguous so that you can walk for you know, 25, 30 miles on wetlands territory. Uh, because it's perceived to be, well, it, it's, it's bird watchers. Uh, people, <clears throat> people love love going to visit the fens. They're, these parks are popular, too. There were school trips there. Um, they're, they're very popular. So they have foot bridges and things like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they've, got, they've got trails. Mind you, I, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to come home today muddy. Uh, I did, too, boy. The, 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 that mud is something. But um, if you don't mind a little mud on your wellies, uh, you'll, you'll do just fine. John? Um, Eric, I'm interested in your idea that expertise is a new kind of knowledge that people are laying claim to in the early modern period. Um, it seems like there are earlier periods where people have claimed at least similar kinds of knowledge to what you were calling expertise. So one that springs immediately to mind is, I'm thinking of the um, sophists in the ancient Greek world, right, claiming moral expertise. Um, that seems to, and, and, and the kind of moral knowledge that they were claiming seems to and, and that Socrates and Plato were contesting seems to somewhat closely fit the conception of expertise that you gave. So I'm just curious to hear about the relationship between this early, that you see between this early modern conception of expertise and older conceptions of what may be similar kinds. Of I approach. know nothing about ancient uh, the ancient Greek philosoph. I, I like the idea of a philosophical expertise. Um, so far as I know, my experts are not thinking in those terms. They're the kinds of knowledge they're claiming are not, I would not argue, are born in the 16th century, but I would argue that in the 16th century there's a systematic effort or, or phenomenon where a new kind of knowledge, a kind of knowledge that has not been widely claimed in the Middle Ages, is being widely claimed by a variety of people who share certain characteristics in common, among them that they're not laying claims solely on the basis of experience. Um, that it's not just that I've done it before. Sometimes I've never done it before, but that doesn't mean I'm not one of the people with this knowledge. They're at pains to distinguish themselves from practitioners. Um, I'm not a carpenter. I'm not a blacksmith or a stonemason. I'm a but I should tell those people what to do. Don't confuse these people with the people who actually get their hands dirty. These are the people who want to manage the project. Part of what makes them expertise, experts, I argue, is their ability to mediate. They're as comfortable at the work site as they are at court. And they can speak in each milieu. Um, and that's by no means unique to the 16th century, but it's very widely claimed in the 16th century. It's also the great period of the how-to book. Um, with the dawn of printing in the, in the century before, between 1550 and 1600 in England, there is an efflorescence of 
books on how to do stuff. And not just how to do it, but how it works. Um, in fact, writing up one of these books is how, one of the ways that you can best lay claim to being an expert. Um, so, But they still have to be commissioned. They still, have to be, they still have to get somebody to believe them. But one of the ways you get someone to believe you is you, you write that book. Um, Henry VIII is scared to death after the Reformation that the Holy Roman Empire and the King of France are going to come and kick his door in. Uh, the way he wants to stop that is by rebuilding all of the coastal fortresses of England. So the 1530s and 40s are a great period of coastal refortification in England. We need people who know how to build forts. But you can't just build forts the same old way you used to build forts because there's now gunpowder weapons. The English don't know how to do this. So they've got to find people who do know how to build the latest technology in forts, and what they wind up deciding is, if you're Italian, you probably know what you're doing. Um, so to be Italian and to say, I can build your fort, probably means the King of England is going to believe you. Um, if you've written a book and you're Italian, you're in. Uh, you can see how these things get negotiated. And then when you, when you succeed, great. And when you fail, you wind up in you know, fleet prison and we, we hire somebody else. Um, my very first project in this was rebuilding Dover Harbor, and it takes them three tries to find somebody who claims they know how to do it, who actually seems to know how to do it. And by the way, what he knows is that he's local, and he knows these guys who live on the coast who know how to build those sorts of walls so the storms don't knock them down. In other words, he doesn't know how to do this either, but he knows who does, and he can connect the people who get their hands dirty with the crown that wants this done, and he's the hero. Um, there's a wonderful book on the Canal de Midi in France, which was built by a tax collector. No experience in hydraulic engineering, no idea. No, we have no idea how this man knew how to build a canal across France, from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean Sea. He does it. He drives Colbert nuts. Colbert wants this canal built. He doesn't trust this guy to get it built. He's, this guy's asking for what, the equivalent of millions of dollars Colbert doesn't want to just hand him millions of dollars. We've got to get somebody who can oversee him, but nobody else knows what he knows. What does he know? It turns out what he knows, if you believe the author of the book, and I think I do, Chandra Mukherjee, what he knows is that the Romans came into the Pyrenees Mountains once upon a time and built aqueducts. That's still the main water supply for the mountain herding peoples who live in those mountains. Now the men, in the winter, take the sheep up into the mountains to graze, and the women have to maintain all these sort of infrastructure of the village. These peasant women in the Pyrenees are the last remaining vestige of what the Romans knew about hydraulic engineering. And this tax collector knows those women. And so they build his canal. Um, it, it's, it's this negotiation that, that you see happen again and again and again. And what's interesting is not just that Pierre-Paul Riquet knows how to build this canal. It's that Colbert doesn't. Colbert doesn't trust this guy to do it. Every guy he sends down there to see if this guy is for real says, well, I don't really understand what he's doing, but he's a nice guy. He seems like he knows what he's talking about. And at the end, Colbert has to decide to take a leap of faith and hands him the equivalent of millions of dollars, and he builds the canal. And it's still there. Um, so it works that time, but it doesn't always. You know, the, for every Pierre Paul Riquet, there's an alchemist who can promise to make you gold out of, out of you know, wood, <laughs> and, uh, and it, that never works. Aaron, um, yeah, I, I know we're after 1:30, so if you have to go, I won't, I won't take it personal. I'll make a quick question. Then. So uh, this is great, obviously, as you get to the end. Uh, um, so uh, I, you know, one of the reasons why it's great is that you have so many actors, kind of people actors in this, uh, you know, the environment, and, uh, the crown. I'm wondering about economics. Uh, that is, especially the inclusion. Good Marxist that you are. Well, <laughs> uh, if a Marxist was to ask, was to approach this. I mean, they say it's all about, about economics. I'm wondering about the enclosure movement. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have some other questions, but I guess that's the. It is all about economics, and it's not. Um, which is to say, you can't possibly understand this unless you understand the crown is broke that every state in Western Europe is broke except Spain, and that's only because they have Peru, um, that, that the, the, the crown's need for money is what ultimately provokes the Civil War. Um, the need for new revenue streams is very intense, and they're looking for everything. And, and outside the crown, I guess I'm thinking about modes of production. There's a bottomless demand for grain at a time of population growth. 
Um, though just at the point they get them drained, the population growth levels off from 1650 to 1700, and the grain market collapses because they get too good at producing it. Um, in the Fens, not least, it collapses. Um, but yes, there's a perception that there's a bottomless demand for grain. They're also tying into a, a, a more market-driven agriculture. Yeah. What do they plant in the fence? Grain. But also coal seed and rape seed, uh, what makes canola oil today. Uh, you can eat that. You can also burn it in lamps, but that's not what they want to do with it. What they want to do with it is part of the dyeing industry. It's part of the English clothing industry. It's becoming part of this massive English imperial economy. The fens can, can contribute to that or they can be a detriment to it. Um, so there's a, there's a very strong economic, capitalist, free market argument to be made within the Fens. That said, if you look at Samuel Hartley, if you look at some of the real proponents of agricultural improvement, they're doing something funky. Yeah, you'll make money doing this, but it's really about millenar millenarianism. It's really about producing this utopian society, preparing, pre you know, prepare ye the way for the Lord. That involves thrift and industry and, uh, and, 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 making the commonwealth all that it can and should be, um, <coughs> that we may be pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, those are the, you get the economic argument to be sure, but you also get this really strong religious argument for why this has to be done. It's got a moral element to it. It is, it is lazy and wasteful for us to let this land lay as it is. We must, we must redeem it for, as we redeem ourselves. So it's, it's certainly economic, but there's people who would tell you it's, it's deeper than that. Even if we made no money doing it, it would still be worth doing. Kind of merciful, right? It is merciful. Those poor sick Fenlanders, if they only understood what was good for them. I want to talk about the poor sick Fenlanders a little bit. I was, I was re really, um, um, I thought it was very provocative you talking about this sort of language around them being savages and barbarians. Um, and where did you find this sort of language? Is it, is it something you might find in, like, you know, reports at the state level? I mean, like, at the imperial level, um, locally, with the you know, these, this first wave of experts, or? Um, yes, it's, you get it from the state, um, Charles the first, not least. I have a wonderful letter from Charles about froward and ignorant men. Uh, this land has been let, let go this way by froward and ignorant men, and we're no longer going to, to allow them to dictate what we do for the good of the con. Yeah, what's, what's Charles really trying to do? Is he, is he just trying to find a revenue stream, or does he really think that, that England will be better off if we make better use of this land? Um, so yes, you, you do get it from, from the very top, that the Fenlanders have mismanaged their land. They are backward, they are sickly, um, they, are, they are helpless. Um, I'm not sure if they actually say savage uh, or uncivilized, but they're certainly helpless sickly, backward, lazy, ignorant, all of those are certainly used. Froward, <laughs> which, my, which my spell check always wants to make forward. Uh, thank you. You see, you all sat there, riveted, <laughs> listening to uh, talk about the fence. We I've been swept this for, away. I've been working on this for 15 away. years. I've still never found a good way in two sentences to capture people with, yes, I work on the drainage of the fence in the 17th century. I, if, I, if I keep talking long enough, I, I, I got them. But <laughs> yeah, 